Hi everyone, I'm Steele Wagstaff. Welcome to our July Pressbooks monthly product update. Um, I want to start off by showing you some new features and products that we have been developing and are shipping out to people soon. The first, uh, we have, uh, as many of you know, released a network catalog not too long ago. And in doing so, we did our best to make sure that it passed all the accessibility guidelines, but we missed a few things. And so we fixed those. And so let me share our screen and just show you very briefly high level of what happened. In your browser, if you want, you can install these little tools that help you do automatic accessibility audits. And so here's an example of a Pressbooks catalog that has a bunch of books and filters and things. And when I ran the accessibility checker, it found five automatic issues. For example, we were using one of these ARIA roles incorrectly. We had this ARIA uh, role. I think it was like, um, I can't remember what the role we had applied here. But we applied an ARIA role that needed a child and it didn't have the child. And then we had uh, some IDs that were not unique. Each time you use an ID element, it needs to be unique. We, we have a search bar and then a hidden search bar that displays only on mobile. But in the DOM, in the page viewer, the, in the, the ID occurs twice. And so that needed to be fixed. Um, and that was related to this one. And then we also applied an ARIA label incorrectly to an element that didn't need one. So we went a little overboard and did it wrong, more or less. So that's what it used to look like. Now, ta -da, I ran the same thing on a Pressbooks network that has the new code changes and look at that clean, no automatic issues in the report. Obviously that doesn't mean that we've addressed everything related to accessibility for every user. Uh, an automatic checker is never enough or sufficient, but we, we did manage to remediate all of the automatic issues that were found and the things that came back from that site report uh, that a client reported to us. We have fixed those in the catalog. If you notice other issues that are affecting accessibility or inclusivity for any of your users, please do let us know. They're important to us. We want to fix them. We want Pressbooks to be a platform that everyone can use uh, and feels invited to use. So that's uh, the first update we have. Okay, second, I wanna show, we have a feature that allows uh, institutions to uh, when you're publishing a book, you can enter metadata for the book. And the metadata for the book includes a whole bunch of information, like the author, the editors, the publishers, et cetera. So I'm gonna share my screen here and show you, there is a feature that allows you to list the uh, institutions that contributed to a book. This was requested not too long ago. And the reason why we built this feature out, let me hide this. The reason why we built this feature out is sometimes people wanna display, like you have a, a Pressbooks network that's shared by multiple campuses or multiple colleges and you wanna display in your catalog or in the directory, the institutions that contributed to a book so they can be filtered. Well, there's a big list of institutions here that we manually created and maintain. It includes a lot of universities in the United States, Canada, Australia, the UK, and parts of Europe, mainly from the, the clients that we support. Well, we had uh, some French speaking universities in Belgium that wrote in and said, hey, we'd, hey, we'd like our institutions to be listed. And so, you can now see that we've added several universities from Belgium. So for example, I could pick any one of these five French speaking institutions in Belgium. I could now apply it to the book information. You'll now see that this book has this Catholic University of Louvain uh, as the institution that contributed. And down in the metadata, it will be displayed uh, for people to, to list. If, if you're watching this video and you say, hey, what about my institution? Why isn't it represented or included? Please do let us know. And we're happy to add other institutions as appropriate to that list that we maintain. The real exciting thing is I didn't write this solution. I didn't code this. Our friend Mitch, who's on the call. This is Mitch's first ever PR. So if you're new to software development and you want to do something like this yourself, it can be done. Uh, congratulations, Mitch. And thank you for contributing this feature to Pressbooks on behalf of our clients. Anything you want to add or say about how, how what your experience was like to encourage others? Well, thanks, uh, Steele. Like, it was fun to do that. And I have to say, like, I do have a little bit of experience in coding, so I didn't find it overwhelming to find the right place to add it. But it was the process is really straightforward, and uh, I was happy to do that. So it was fun to be able to contribute. That's what I wanted to hear. It's fun to contribute. Thank you, Mitch. Um, so the last thing I'll mention, I don't show it, but there was a there was a bug that was affecting LTI launch links in the newest releases of Moodle. So Moodle 4.x or whatever uh, in the 4 branch, 
they were interpreting what's called the LTI hint differently than we had initially uh, supposed. And when that change happened, it meant that LTI links were breaking from the way Pressbooks was creating them. So we submitted a change to the underlying library that Pressbook uses to generate that LTI hint statement. And now it's being properly parsed and displayed. So if you're using the latest releases of Moodle, you should see that the LTI connections and the links are working as expected. So just wanted to notify people about that. Um, those were the kind of big or major changes that we've made to the customer facing product. The big thing that we've been spending time on and thinking about over the last month has been our product called Results for LMS. And so in this portion of the, the meeting, I'd like to share with you kind of a, a research update that Michelle and I worked on. So Michelle and I will kind of split this part. It'll be a little bit of a presentation mode and there's some slides that accompany it. So if you want to see the slides or reference them later, I'll put them here in the chat. But this is uh, basically what we know about the results for LMS product and what we're going to focus on and what we are focusing on improving for this fall and in the future. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen and give, just give some context. So if you have not used results for LMS before, um, what it is, is it's a way to connect your Pressbooks, a book published in Pressbooks, to your learning management system. We do that via a specification called LTI. And LTI allows a third-party tool to connect into the LMS. When you've connected a book with, with LTI, it allows students to launch the book securely, view it in the frame of the learning management system, and it will provision a Pressbooks account for them silently so that they can access private content or other, give them all the permissions they need to read the book or even to create if that's what you want to do. The, the reason why we call it results for LMS is this add-on product not only lets you connect the book to the LMS, but it also allows you to, um, when a student completes embedded H5P activities, it can roll up their performance and send it back to the grade book. So you can see how well a student did on quizzes or quiz sets or multiple choice questions that have been embedded in a Pressbooks chapter. And so it's helpful to give instructors and students some insight into the learning that's taking place. The first part we wanna kind of talk about is what the user journey looks like, the kind of phases of using this product. And Michelle as the UX uh, expert and specialist has kind of broken this down and will give us kind of high level overview of what an instructor does and experiences as they use this product. Michelle, I'll pass it on to you if you're willing. For sure. Uh, so we've identified that there are four main phases that instructors go through when they're using the results for LMS product. So the first is, of course, uh, we got foundation building, testing and integration, configuring for class and revising. And so the first one, foundation building, um, is a little bit just about, um, this is where you actually build all of your materials. So you're going to be writing your textbook or using pre-existing material. You're also going to be either writing H5P questions or you're going to be double checking the ones that exist and adapting them to your content. Uh, and then of course you're downloading and uploading these to the chapters and adding those sections into the book uh, before you actually start the next process, which is uh, integration and testing. Uh, and so in this phase, uh, you preview a lot of your activities to make sure that they're correct. Uh, you attempt them to make sure you have your max score, select them for grading, and then you also configure a bunch of grading settings before exporting all of this information into the LMS that you are using. Uh, so the third one is about configuring it for class. So this is all on the LMS side. Uh, so you're going to be importing the links, uh, the files that you have from Pressbooks. You're going to be adding non-Pressbooks readings, links, discussion forum, the things that you really do to flesh out the class. Uh, and then you will be publishing the course. Um, and then you can preview and test the graded activities, as well as look at the uh, grades that are going to be displayed uh, from the students once they complete the questions. And then the last, of course, is a revision period. So if no textbook is perfect, and uh, it will always take a couple of tries before really nailing it in. Uh, so this is the part where you would be taking the questions and comments, ideally, from your students and then adapting your content for a better run the next time around. It's Michelle. So a little bit of product history. First, built this product and delivered it in two courses taught at the University of Texas Arlington in fall and spring of 2021. 
And then in the summer and fall of 2021, Amy, who's on this call, and I conducted the very first pilot of this product. And we had uh, four or five instructors in each term from four or five different client schools try out the product. And we did really kind of heavy handholding and lots of interviews and just understanding what is it like to use this product? What do you wish you had? What, what are the needs and features and desires you have for this? At the end of that, we released a first set of UX and UI improvements focused on like, okay, let's simplify this. Let's make this easier. Let's adjust, address the major pain points. That was in January, 2022. And we really haven't touched the product or done a lot with it since then, except that we discovered through the use of this that there were some grade reliability concerns. Initially, we thought, oh, it's because users are doing it wrong. And then in the course of kind of deeper investigation, we found it were in fact some reliability issues that we needed to fix in the product. And we're able to replicate those and roll out the fixes recently. So at this point, we have a con. It's doing what it's supposed to do, but it was a learning experience. So what were these pilots? I'll kind of give a high level summary of what we did. And Amy may want to chime in and fill in details if I missed some stuff. First, we, we called it REAP, it's a bad acronym, but it's the Results Early Adopters Program. We did it in the summer and fall of 2021, and we had uh, participating clients from Bay Path University, the College of DuPage, Virginia Tech, the Maricopa Community College System, Open Oregon and the Umco Community College, and the University of Washington. They used a combination, mostly Canvas, but there was a couple of courses using Blackboard. And in the pilot, we had really two sets of goals side on the product side, I really wanted to know, does results for LMS actually fulfill a need that instructors and learners have? Do the instructors like it? Would they use it again? And would they advocate for other people to use it? Was it not only did it fill a need, but was it a satisfying experience? And instructors and learners wish what it could do that it does not do now. So like, what are the missing features and what could make this better? On the support side of things, because we're providing this to instructors and because it sent great the great book, we really needed to find out like, how support do instructors need or learners from in using this product because it is different from the regular Pressbooks authoring interface. Um, another question we had was how hard is it to create and configure graded activities and connect to the LMS? And how can we make it easier to use this product? When we asked instructors what their goals were, they said they wanted to increase engagement and do formative assessment. And so you can see some sample things that instructors said. I want to highlight a couple that I think were nice. One of them said they want to automatically grade students so they feel incentivized to complete the activities. This was something we heard really common, like instructors saying, hey, I'm asking students to do the reading, and then I have no idea whether they do or whether they or did they understand the reading. I don't find out until they come to lecture, and then often I have to throw away my plans because they either didn't do it or did it but didn't understand it. So that was something they wanted to change. Another person said, I want my textbook to resemble what publishers provide, less dry, more bells and whistles. So it was really about the interactive components that they were excited to build in. The other thing that we heard people saying was doing formative assessment. And when we say formative, what we mean is um, activities that you complete repeatedly where you're getting immediate feedback to help you check your understanding. The important point is not the overall grade you're assigning if you were doing a summative, but it's assessment that helps you learn as you're forming ideas or you're shaping your understanding. So the, the, the one that I really wanted to hi highlight here was, I'm looking for formative monitoring of student progress through the textbook, showing their progress, as well as their challenges and areas in need of assistance or greater explanation. Instructors want visibility into what students are learning so they can help them learn more effectively. And students want the same thing. So that's what we we found, or that they, their goals in participating. Amy and I did a bunch of stuff to help them. I don't need to do this in detail, but it was just what we did to do the pilot. Um, and that's what we did in 2021. Here's what we learned. The first thing is we did a survey and we polled uh, seven of the eight instructors who participated, gave us feedback on the survey. And 85 students also com completed a, a voluntary survey. The student response rate was really varied across the courses. Some instructors said, no, I don't want to give my students a survey. And some said, I'll give it to them, but I'm not really going to push it. And if they remember to do it or I put it, you know, so, so some instructors really said, hey, this is important. And all their students responded, some almost none and some literally none. So the just take that with the grain of salt when you see. Response. 
here's the first set of questions. We said, how efficacious, how does this work for engagement and learning? Students told us that compared to other courses and textbooks, their level of engagement with this course was higher than average. We asked them on a scale of one to five, with one being low, much lower and one, five being much higher, three being the same. Average score is 3.8, which means slightly more than, than average. We also asked them, compared to other courses and textbooks you've used, how effective was it in helping you learn the required course material? They rank that a little higher still, closer to an average score of four. When we asked instructors the same question, they ranked it yet even higher. And they said, ah, this was very effective in helping my students learn compared to other courses I've taught in the past. And so that felt promising and was, we felt like, hey, this is on the right track for where we want to head. Obviously, we'd love it to be fives across the board, but this was the honest answers we got. When we asked instructors how hard it was and how much effort it took to do this, we asked first, like, Okay, compared to other courses, how effective was the textbook in providing you with insight into what students were learning? So if you look back, this was how effective was it in helping them learn? They said very, giving them insight into what they were learning. <laughs> Excuse me. When we said insight into what, it was more like, well, about average. It didn't give them that much more insight into what they were learning, just that they were learning. When we asked about the level of effort, they said slightly more than normal. And how difficult was it? Again, slightly more than average difficulty. So these were things that we wanted. We knew that it would be hard for them to do something new. And it, they confirmed, yes, indeed, it was harder than, I, than normal. And so that was something for us to pay attention to. Finally, we asked them about satisfaction. How likely are you to use this product in a future version of your course? And the score is quite high, 4.28 on average. How likely to recommend it to a colleague? or to advocate that your institution purchased this product for broader, broader use. The score for both of those was 3.86 out of five. And so that was the initial data that we collected and what we learned from quantitative survey results. So the next thing that we wanna highlight would be the known problems and the things that we're working on now and what we plan to do to address them to make this product better, which is a big focus for us in the, in the current, present and near future. Sadly, grade passback wasn't reliable. We thought that it was in our testing and we found that it was, but there were a couple of things that students could do that would break the grade passback. For example, if they launched an activity and started it and then launched another activity in a new tab, the session would get zeroed out. And so the second tab would be the only active session. They could complete the activity, it's integrate, but if they went back to the first one that they'd launched previously, it no longer had an active session and it wouldn't send those, those grades. We didn't realize that, that was happening because it never came up in our testing. And then a student helped us verify that. That was a major issue because it was hard for us to replicate. We're like, wait, every time we launch a session, it works. But we hadn't launched multiple sessions in multiple tabs, and that posed a problem. So we had a handful of small bugs that were affecting reliability and were hard for us to pinpoint. Thanks to really hard work from our developers and from our testers, Ricardo particularly is on call, um, we fixed those bugs and we shipped fixes and releases that we think account for all of the use cases that we've seen. And so just grow confidence. We want more people to use the product. We wanna use it and make sure that they have it with a bug-free experience that isn't frustrating for students and instructors. So that was the first issue. The second issue is we don't really know who's using this product all that well. We don't know which clients are in it, how much they're using it. And, and so we just need to increase visibility to the network managers and to ourselves about who's adopting this product, who wants to adopt this product, we haven't done a lot of product marketing around this. We haven't really communicated directly with instructors. It's sort of been like something that people have to ask us about. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we can turn it on. So that's something we want to consciously change. We believe that this can impact student learning and that instructors want to impact student learning. And so we want to make sure that people who want to use this product understand what it is, understand its pricing very clearly, and can make informed decisions about and try it and really just try it. So the big thing we're going to change here is we're going to do more focused outreach to network managers. We're going to invite people to participate in no-cost pilots to try out the product and help us improve it. And so that's what's happening starting this fall. The third thing we learned, and Michelle alluded to this, instructors said sometimes there were too many steps. It made things that should be simple time-consuming. The configuration for this was just too complex initially. So we've done some work. Uh, after that first round of pilots, we made a bunch of changes to the interface. 
we made it cleaner, easier to use, hopefully, and, and can rechange some of the configuration settings. There's still a lot of work to do. At the time that we built this product and improved it, we did not have a professional UX UI designer and developer on our staff. And now we do. So Michelle has done some really cool work on UX heuristic analysis, and we've started doing user research. And that will be a major focus of our fall pilot. How can we make this user experience easier? How can we reduce cognitive load? How can we make this just flow easier for you? A fourth issue, instructors said, hey, all you're giving me is a high level aggregate grade. That's not enough. One instructor said, I had to fix problems with grade submissions blindly and guess at what the score should be because I couldn't actually see the underlying answers the students gave. And I, I have to say, if I were in there, I feel exactly the same way. Grade alone is not really insight into student learning. And so now what we're doing is we're really actively researching a, a, a tool called the Learning Record Store. And a learning store is a place where you store more detailed learning analytics about student attempted, they scored a three out of five on this activity. They answered A, B, and D. The correct answers were C and D. That kind of information needs to be collected and made visible for this to be valuable for instructors and clients. And so we have a lot of learning to do there, but we're, we're, we'll show a little demo of what's in progress later in the call. And that's, I think, a real exciting opportunity for us to actually give insight to learning. And that leads me to this. The, the fifth issue is students don't know where to focus their energy for improved learning. And instructors don't know how well is this course material helping students learn? Where are my individual students struggling? Or where's the whole class struggling? So we're trying to understand some of the highest priority needs and interests for both instructors. And this will be the focus of our fall pilot. We want to enroll at least a thousand students and as many instructors as we want to use the tool. And we're going to be doing UX research interviews and finding out what matters most to you. What do you wish you knew that you don't know? And then trying to rapidly build things that help answer those questions to make this product better. So that's what we do there. Here's the sixth one, probably the hardest of all. Sometimes the activities just aren't very well designed. Um, this is a do-it-yourself learning tool. And many instructors don't know how to make effective learning experiences. If you've been a college teacher before, you probably know there wasn't a lot of training, at least for me when I was teaching in college courses, there was almost no training on effective pedagogy, even less training on instructional design principles or the science of learning. Earlier in this call, I was talking with Simon and over his shoulder, he had this great book called How Learning Works. It's a super important book with lots of great concepts about that, but that knowledge is not widely distributed among instructors. And sometimes we make poorly designed learning activities. And so we have some things that we want to try to do to help increase instructor awareness and some ideas for how we can make it easier to make effective learning happen on the instructor side. Um, in particular, Amy is going to be leading a couple of workshops in the next month or two that really focus on H5P and interactive activity creation. <laughs> uh, I'm currently working on a webinar series about um, how to create H5P activities. I myself have never taught, so I'm, I'm not an expert on instructional design, all of you are, but uh, I'll just be talking about how to navigate across the platform in order to be able to create the H5P activities. I'll show some really good examples of how others have used them and where to find the right resources to be able to create them. So think of me as like your cover to find the right things as much as I am, and not as much of a, as a, as a design expert. Um, and uh, and yeah, if you have any tidbits to share, make sure to come. If you have instructors that you know of who are going to be creating assessments in the fall um, or, or activities in the fall, um, uh, please send them our way. Uh, the second part of this webinar series we're hoping will be a panel. Um, if they want to come and talk about their experience with building many H5P activities for their book, we would love to have them. So um, make sure to send them our way for that as well. Thanks. Okay, so Cheryl asked, at the University of Arizona, we have a new institutional H5P subscription to the H5P.com product, and we haven't implemented results, Pressbooks results from this yet. For now, Pressbooks built-in plugin does not connect to your institutional H5P.com instance. Will results connect to that instance directly so faculty aren't potentially creating H5P content in two places? 
That's a great question, Cheryl. And um, right now, you're right. So right now, the way that people create H5P and Pressbooks is through an H5P plugin in the Pressbooks universe. We have talked with H5P, the Ubel, the makers of H5P, about a wrapper for H5P.com that does the same thing as the current wrapper for the, the free and um, open source H5P version. Nothing has been built. They mentioned that they would be interested in building this so that we could build tighter integrations, but we didn't have an interested institution at the time that had, it was a more theoretical question than a practical one. So the last I heard from Sventura was a year and a half ago. And they said, yeah, we'd be interested to build this wrapper and you could consume it. They would want money from us to do that. And I think that's within the realm of reasonable possibility, especially if it helps you avoid a problem that you're having. But we we haven't seen any development on that and nothing has been started that we have had conversations about it. So right now it's not possible, but in the future it definitely could be. If there were demand for it, I would really push hard to make sure that it does happen. We don't want that to be annoying for people. Currently, if you build an activity on the h5p.com instance, you can, of course, download it and re-upload it to the Pressbooks network. But the, for example, our solution, it's going to require sending X API statements to a learning record store and then visualizing them. Those have to be essentially statements that are hosted on our infrastructure because we have to direct the to an endpoint. And we won't have the same control over what's happening with h5p.com statements, at least to the best of my knowledge, unless there were a wrapper that allowed us to do that. And so that's all stuff we would need to explore with Yubel and Centura because they host their those activities there, whereas we host the activities built inside the books. And that's the that's the rub, I think. All right. So the, the next thing that I wanted to show is we have been doing a lot of research into the learning record stores. And this is pretty exciting. Um, I don't know how much people know about XAPI or how much they care to know about XAPI, but I'll give a little, a little crash course and then we'll talk about the practical applications. So XAPI refers to the Experience API, and it's a specification for structuring statements about learning. It can describe both online and offline learning, but the basic format follows a triple pattern. Every XAPI statement has an actor, has a verb or an action, and then it has a context statement. So for example, you could have a statement that said, steal answered question A and scored three out of five. The actor would be steal, the verb would be answered, and the context or the object would be question five and three out of five. That's the kind of basic format of the XAPI statement. Every H5P interaction produces or emits these XAPI statements. But if you don't listen for them, they just go into the ether and disappear. Up until now, Pressbooks, we haven't listened for them. We said, oh, that, we're just fine to let them go in the ether. But what instructors are telling us is that when we're using the results product, we actually do want to know more about learning. And the method to do that is to collect those XAPI statements, to structure and organize them, and then to give you some way of giving you insight into the patterns that emerge from that. So we're taking slightly structured JSON information and showing you things that you might want to know as an instructor. So Michelle and I have been designing and developing an initial prototype for what we're calling like a chapter activity viewer that would be part of the results product that would help satisfy this instructor desire to see more information about student learning. Our goal is to work with our development team on a quick cycle and produce a minimum viable product or proof of concept that could be used as part of this fall pilot. So we're on a tight timeline and we're working really hard and really fast. And what I'm gonna ask Michelle to do is to share a Figma, which is our design software, to kind of give you a, a high level overview of what we're planning to build so you can see a sneak preview and give us any comments, feedback, uh, ideas that you have as we're designing and building this. You'll see it for real soon, but this is the first official preview. And I'll hand it to Michelle again. For sure. I just want to reiterate again, this is definitely part of the process. This is the very first stage, so it's not very beautiful, but we are working through the issues and how things should be laid out so that it is functional and works really well for instructors. Uh, so I'll start off by saying it's kind of a two-tiered approach in the sense that we want to make sure that all the information that instructors bring in uh, about the H5P is considered, and this is kind of 
the main area that then is filtered through at where you get the results from students. So things that the instructor would bring in are, of course, the chapters, activity name, the type, what the max possible score is, and what the actual answer is for those questions that were created. And then, of course, on the student information, we have the student ID, the activity name, the attempts they have made, the score, the response given, and the time submitted of those answers. Uh, and so our first sort of flow through, um, if we had sort of chapter three selected and we really wanted to look at this one um, question, H5P question, the Wisconsin flora and fauna flashcards, um, we could do that and then it would give all of the students that have completed that activity and you'd be able to see what their attempts are, the score and those responses given the time submitted. Essentially, this is what it would look like. Uh, then of course we have kind of more iterations and little edge cases. So what if they have more things selected? What does that look like? If you have multiple selections, are you able to uh, expand and collapse these so you're better able to focus on the content that's on the page? Um, if you have other sorts of activities that have, uh, if you want to check the different attempts, uh, and then also, of course, we have more detail about the popovers. So with the time submitted, you should be able to look at it through a calendar view as well as more granular timestamp. Uh, and you should also be able to see different types of attempts. So all of the attempts or the last one or the first or the best attempt that the student has made. We also have the chapter dialogue uh, popover. Uh, and then that applied to say, if we wanted to see what all the attempts were, for this one multiplication activity, that's what it would look like. And you'd be able to check out the score from there. So this is what we're working for. This is a real base of the product. And now we're also figuring out exactly like how do we want to show the responses? How can we make this information really meaningful for instructors to engage both with their students and maybe make their own refinements, get the information that they need in order to take action next? Thank you, Michelle. I really love the how smooth you are in demoing that, despite it being a very early prototype. The things that I want to stress are the goal for us that's really important. If you could just share that screen again, Michelle, I just want to. Oh talk yeah, to sure. You. And there's, I think, kind of three key components that I want to highlight out of this. The first is there will be ideally in the top left of the page. That's what we're seeing now. That chapter selector. So what will happen is depending on which chapter you want to look at. The, the, the statements in the bottom would be all of the activities that were generated within that particular chapter. So usually instructors are thinking of the chapter as the assignment. And so let's say I wanna see what happened when a student scored a 45 out of 50 on chapter three, this will be the details of that. And then you can say, let's look at chapter one next. And the bottom of the page would refresh and show you all of the attempts that are relative to chapter one. The second piece that's really important to us is that instructors should be able to drill down and select some or all of the statements in a given chapter. They should be able to select by the type of activity or the specific activity. So if you wanna see how did students do on just this particular quiz question, then you could see that. Or if you wanted to see how did a single student do on all of them, you could filter by student or by activity. And we also want them to filter, be able to filter by which attempt. So maybe you're interested only in how did students do on the very first try they took on this quiz? Because that tells you more about like what they actually learned from the reading rather than they got better with practice, but like what's their, where did they, where did they start out with? So you should be able to filter by attempt. Those are the kind of crucial features that we think we want to have. Like the information should be displayed in a table format and give the instructor the ability to kind of drill down at the level of the student or the level of the activity. The third kind of component that we're thinking about is how to make this compact information display compact and interesting so that you can get insight quickly, but also able to be expanded so that you can see more if you want to know more. So we're trying to get a good, healthy default state that's just enough information for the uh, most use cases, and then give people the flexibility to see what they want to see or answer the particular questions they have. You can see that some of the principles that are in play that we've done for things like the network catalog or the directory, where we present a large 
body of information and give you searching and filtering tools to see a smaller subset. And the next stage for us is to build the technology behind this and the data storage so that we can populate this with real data and then get it into the hands of instructors who have actual questions about student learning and make it better based on what they tell us they want and need. So that's what's coming for us and that's what we're working on. Happy to answer any questions about what we have in mind and timeline and what's going on with our pilot. Um, but the big the big thing to mention is this fall, we're doing another round of pilot. Uh, Amy and I are recruiting institutions and instructors now. If your institution wants to participate or you know of instructors that have built H5P activities and are interested in this kind of information, let us know. We'd love to sign them up. We want to help them succeed. We want to learn from them. And we want to make sure that what we're building is something that people want and that they find useful for accomplishing their teaching and learning goals. So that's what we had to share on the results front today. There's just a couple of questions about pilot participation for the fall. The first question was, if we want to participate in the pilot, but we don't have many ready, ready for this fall, uh, will the pilot be available in the spring? And the answer is yes, totally. We're anticipating this to be a fall through spring pilot and maybe even longer. So if you want to participate in the spring, let us know and we'll have to get you in there. We're really focused on the fall since that's about to start right now, but spring is also available. The second is, how do we learn more about what, what's, in, what's entailed with this pilot, more of the details? So there's a document I just put in the chat that explains what the pilot is, the rough timeline, and there's a um, interest form that you can fill out that says, hey, I'm an institution that wants to participate. It's going to ask you whether you have permission to set up the LTI configuration if you've already configured LTI, which is the backend stuff that network managers and LMS admins have to take care of for instructors, and then whether you have, you've already identified instructors and books who want to use this or whether you need help finding instructors and books at your institution to pilot the pro program. So we can definitely help you find people because we have a pretty good awareness for of who's doing what on your network. Or if you already have people in mind, that's great, even better. Our, our general feeling is when we've done pilots in the past, having a cohort of say three to five instructors at a school makes the experience a lot nicer because you have people that you're doing this with at your institution. But we can also make up cohorts across institutions, and that's fine, too. We're happy to make it a friendly learning community. So uh, one or many or whatever you want to do it, but we're just uh, eager to get this into the hands of instructors and to learn from them about how well this is actually meeting their needs. And that's been the focus for us in the last month, and it will be the focus for us in August, too. So expect to hear more about this at our August monthly product update. And Instead of just a wireframe in Figma, hopefully you, we will be able to show you some working software and initial responses from real instructors at that point. Thanks everybody for coming out to our monthly product update. We really do appreciate all that you do and um, want to help support you succeed in whatever way we can. Talk to you soon.